you've probably all seen our new 273 V8 engine. And maybe you've had a chance to find out what a snappy performer it is, too. I sure did, Tech. I thought the optional 225 Slant 6 was terrific in the Valiant and Dart, but our new V8 really outperforms it. And I know the new engine's lighter and more compact than any of our other V8s. Yeah, it's a sweet engine, Russ. A short-stroke overhead valve V8 that delivers 180 horsepower from 273 cubic inches. And thanks to that 8.8 to 1 compression ratio, it does it on regular gas. I've noticed that the new engine looks a lot like our other V8s. Although it is a new engine, it incorporates a lot of the best features of our other engines. I'll bet it was quite a project to design a V8 engine to go with our compact Valiant and Dart. That's right, Ernie. But our engineers did it. They used the latest foundry methods. This reduced the wall thickness and weight of the cylinder block and other major castings. I see they've used a low air cleaner and a flat single-plane manifold to get hood clearance. You also better take a look at those manifold bolts. Notice that they aren't at right angles to the manifold mounting surface. As a result, it's very important to tighten the bolts evenly and in this sequence. If you don't, you might get a manifold gasket leak that would suck oil out of the tappet chamber and into the cylinders. The right procedure's in the reference book. Also, when you install the manifold gasket, make sure the embossed bead of the gasket is toward the head. Thanks for the tip, Tech. Since this engine uses the same crankshaft and connecting rods and rod and main bearings that have done such a good job in our higher power 318 and Canadian 313 V8s, the new engine should be exceptionally durable. The pistons in this new engine are aluminum alloy. Two steel inserts are cast into the piston skirt to make the piston expand at almost the same rate as the cylinder bore during warm-up. Now, what do you know about installing rings, Russ? The right way to install the two steel rails of the oil ring is to put one end of the rail in the groove and spiral the rail in place, down over the top of the piston. You won't need to use a ring installing tool for this, but be sure to use the right size tool for installing compression rings. You'll need the one for a 3 and 5 eighths bore. In fact, the C263 tool that you used on earlier engines is the right size. The four pockets machined in the top of the piston give valve clearance for either bank of cylinders. That'll be a help. Now, what else is new about the piston? Well, the piston pins are the same diameter as those in the 318 engine, but they're about 3 sixteenths of an inch shorter, and they have thicker walls. You might be interested to know that they're made heavier, so they'll give the proper balance with the smaller pistons. That is an interesting point, Tech. And here's something else that I think is interesting. The right-hand exhaust manifold is a conventional three-branch type, but look at the unusual design of the left manifold. The left exhaust manifold, with its high runner and sweeping curve at the back, provides steering gear clearance, Ernie. Now, let me give you some service tips on the exhaust manifolds. On a car equipped with power brakes, for example, you have to remove the brake booster unit before removing the left manifold. On a Valiant or Dart with manual transmission, you should disconnect the transmission linkage at the steering column before removing the left manifold. Otherwise, you might damage the linkage. Before removing the left manifold of a torque flight-equipped car, you should remove the transmission throttle linkage bracket and then carefully work the manifold past the steering column and lift it out front end first. Don't ever over-tighten the manifold cap screws and stud nuts. If you do, normal expansion and contraction of the manifold could damage the manifold. The correct torque is 15 foot-pounds. I see that the exhaust manifold gaskets have metal heat shields to protect the spark plugs from the high exhaust heat. And here's another exhaust system feature. Both exhaust manifolds have ball-type connections at the exhaust pipe flanges. This type of connection is easier to line up when you're attaching the exhaust pipe, and it causes less stress in the pipe and manifold. Here's something to remember when you're installing the left exhaust manifold. Don't neglect to attach the two brace rods to the flange. These rods give a solid mounting to keep the exhaust system from vibrating at certain engine speeds. Okay, Tech, I won't forget them. Say, I've noticed that a new steering center link had to be designed to clear the oil pan on the new V8. 
Does this affect service? Yes, it does, Russ. To remove the oil pan, you have to drop the steering center link from the idler arm and pitman arm and remove the exhaust pipe first. Then you have to loosen the front engine mounts and raise the front of the engine half an inch so the pan will clear. That's all I have on the lower portion of the engine, so let's talk about the heads next, okay? Sure. The cylinder head story is a good one. Ernie, for one thing, the rocker shaft support brackets and valve guides are cast right into the head casting. Also, the cylinder heads are lighter, thanks to their design and the latest casting techniques. The combustion chambers are wedge-shaped, and the spark plugs are located as close as possible to the volume center of the wedge for uniform combustion. Speaking of the spark plugs, the new engine uses the same long-reach spark plugs as our Slam 6 engines do, and they're gapped and torqued down to the same specifications, too. That's right. But just be sure you use gaskets when you install these plugs in a V8. Okay, Tech. Say, I've noticed that all the valves are located in a straight line in each cylinder head. That's a familiar feature. Yep. And because the valves are in line, the intake and exhaust rocker arms are identical. Intake valves should be set to 13 thousandths and exhaust valves to 21 thousandths. The exhaust valves are the two center valves and the two end valves in each bank. You need a new valve stem length gauge and new valve guide wire gauges for the new engine because the valve dimensions are different from any other engine. Tell me, are there any interchangeable parts in the valve train? You bet, Ernie. In the valve train, the tappets, valve springs, and spring retainers are interchangeable with those for the 318 V8. But on the other hand, the camshaft is not interchangeable because both the lobe location and design are different. And the 273 V8 uses a new 5 eighths inch timing chain and sprockets. You'll find interchangeable parts in the lubrication system, too. The oil pump and pump drive and the oil pan and gasket for the new engine are the same as the 318 V8. And here's something else to remember about the lubrication system. You should install the oil filter adapter so that the filter cartridge points rearward. If you install the adapter the other way, there'd be no room for the cartridge. I see the cooling system's bigger than six-cylinder jobs. A new V8 Valiant or Dart with heater has a 17-quart cooling system. In Canada, that's equal to 14 Imperial Quarts. Now, before we go any further, someone better change this record. You know, I've learned a lot of interesting things about this new V8 engine today, Tech. Me too. And we haven't even mentioned the ignition and fuel system yet. In the ignition system, I'm sure you realize that the distributor is calibrated to an individual ignition advance curve that meets only this engine's spark advance requirements. Yes, we do, Tech. And that means the distributor shouldn't be interchanged with the 318 engine distributor, despite the fact that they appear to be identical. Yeah, even something as simple as that could really cut down performance. On this new engine, we set ignition timing to 5 degrees before top center for cars with manual transmission and 10 degrees before top center for cars with torque flight. Here's something interesting. Notice how the spark plug cables are supported in brackets on the head covers and kept apart by plastic separators. Those plastic separators are used to prevent any chance of cross-firing, Russ. Oh, yes. I can see why it's important to be sure that they're in place. Now, what do you know about the fuel system, Ernie? A ball-and-ball dual downdraft carburetor is used on the new engine. One way to quickly distinguish this carburetor from other BBD units is by its much thicker throttle body to main body gasket. A flexible cable throttle linkage is used with the new engine. It isolates the accelerator pedal from engine vibration. Here's the right way to adjust that throttle linkage. Disconnect the automatic transmission linkage at the carburetor. When the engine is warmed up so the choke is fully open, adjust curb idle. Loosen the clamp and move the cable housing ferrule rearward just enough to remove all slack from the cable. Your cable adjusting tool makes this easy to do. After that, you move the ferrule forward a quarter of an inch before you tighten the clamp. Now, that quarter inch slack is to make sure the cable doesn't interfere with the idle setting. It'll also give you the right pedal angle. Well, that covers the throttle cable adjustment. But uh, what about adjusting the automatic transmission linkage? 
always make sure the transmission throttle linkage adjustment is right any time you've reset engine idle. That's a mighty important point, Tech. On cars with torque flight, I check and adjust the transmission throttle linkage right after setting curb idle. That way, the choke will be open and the throttle will be off fast idle for the adjustment. The transmission throttle linkage is made up of two bell cranks and three rods. There are two adjustment points, but the adjustment is quite easy. Here's how. Disconnect both the carburetor rod ball socket and the intermediate rod ball socket so you can adjust them. Adjust the intermediate rod length first. To do this, lock the upper bell crank with a 3 16 rod through the holes in the bell crank bracket and lever. Then, push down on the intermediate rod so that the transmission lever is held against its stop and adjust the ball socket so it lines up with the ball on the bell crank. When the intermediate rod socket is lined up with the bell crank ball, connect the socket to the ball and remove the locking rod from the bell crank bracket and lever. Well, that doesn't look too hard. What's next? Next, adjust the length of the carburetor rod. You do this in two steps. First, hold the carburetor rod forward so the transmission lever is against its stop and adjust the socket so it lines up with the ball on the carburetor lever. Make sure the idle speed screw is against the stop when you do this. Then, lengthen the rod by four complete turns of the adjustment to eliminate free play in the linkage and attach the socket to the ball. Uh, let me add one point here, Ernie. After you connect the transmission linkage, test for binding and make sure the flexible throttle cable doesn't interfere with a carburetor rod or bell crank. Thanks, Tech. I'll remember that. Say, hey, Ernie, you told us how you adjust the transmission throttle linkage when the engine's warmed up, but how do you handle the job with a cold engine? I don't, unless I'm sure all carburetor adjustments are okay. You see, if carburetor curb idle is wrong, the carburetor throttle lever position will be wrong for the transmission throttle linkage adjustment. If curb idle is right, you can adjust the transmission throttle linkage the same as for a hot engine. Just make sure the choke is fully open and the throttle is in curb idle position. Well, that just about wraps up linkage adjustments. But you know, you can't just drop this new V8 engine into a standard Valiant or DOT and call it quits. To finish the package, other powertrain components had to be modified to handle the increased engine power. Why not cover torque flight changes, Russ? Sure, Tech. The A904 torque flight is the only unit with a silhouette low enough for the Valiant and Dart, so it was modified to provide greater torque transmission capacity for the new engine. Both the front and rear clutches have four clutch discs instead of three. The clutch pressure plates are steel, and they take up less space than the cast iron plates they replace. The overrunning clutch rollers and housing are longer and stronger. And to provide clearance for this bigger clutch, the reverse drum has an undercut on its rear thrust face, like the A727 drum. A bigger reverse band servo is used, and the lever and link have been modified to provide more leverage and greater band application pressure. The reverse lever is not the only lever that's been changed. The kick-down lever is the same one that's used in the maximum performance A727 torque flight. This change gives greater leverage for more positive kick-down band application. I suppose the transmission case had to be modified to take the bigger reverse servo and overrunning clutch, and the bell housing had to be revised to fit the new V8 block. That's right, Ernie. Now let's see what else Russ knows about the new torque flight version. Okay, Tech. Well, for one thing... The valve body assembly uses the A727 transfer plate. This transfer plate has a larger passage to the reverse servo for faster application of the reverse band. In the transmission extension, the output shaft has a ball bearing instead of a bushing to handle the greater loads. This bearing eliminates the need for an overrunning clutch thrust washer. Also, the rear pump has a new drive arrangement that uses a pin drive in place of the previous ball drive. Of course, there are a few other changes too, but these are the more important ones. You might like to know that a lot of the changes you've mentioned are also used in the current six-cylinder engine transmissions for greater interchangeability. Now, what do you know about the rest of the powertrain, Ernie? 
In the differential, the main drive pinion has a chamfer. It's needed for clearance because the V8 differential case is larger for added strength. The pinion with chamfered end is used in all 64 Valiants and Darts, both V8 and Slant 6 models. This cuts down the number of non-interchangeable parts in these two units. However, you can't use the V8 differential case in earlier models. And as a matter of fact, you can't use the sure grip differential in earlier models either. In both cases, drive pinion clearances are too close. Thanks, Tech. I'll remember that tip and all the others you've given me, too. I think we both got a lot of good out of this powwow on the new V8 and its powertrain. You know, Russ, I'm sure that all our technicians are interested in the new 273 cubic inch engine package. And for still more information, you'll find that the reference book is full of service tips and tune-up and adjustment specifications. The new power brake unit for Valiant and Dart is covered, too. So let's use the information in our reference books to keep this great new power plant performing like the Chrysler-built thoroughbred it is. Music